Good afternoon. So, Mr. Baker gave us uh, some of the, the characters that we have that uh, some of you or even all of you will experience working on the continent. So we have the Dos Santos family in Angola. We have the Obiang family in uh, Equatorial Guinea. We have the major political party, Frilimo, in Mozambique, and so on. Um, and uh, it is a very, very complex problem on the issue of corruption um, as Mr. Baker mentioned, you really have this phenomenon of patronage politics that is also fueling this corruption issue where you will have the big man, the president, uh, and his family who will consider the, the country and the state coffers as his personal property. And so that, when you make an, try to make an example out of a key person, uh, it's, it's only temporary because it's going to come back again. So it is a major issue and it's multifaceted. What I'm going to be telling you about is the work that my organization, Gallup, uh, does uh, around the world and for me specifically uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. So I'm going to start with the methodology very briefly. I, we, we could be here all week to tell you about how we do this work that we call the World Poll. Uh, and then I'll tell you a little bit about how I personally do this work in sub-Saharan Africa. I'll tell you about uh, the governance indexes that we have built over the years, as well as potential implications for uh, all the measures, all the metrics that we have and potential opportunities for external stakeholders. And I attended the last few minutes of the previous presentation and the speaker mentioned that there was a dearth of data uh, from the, the continent and that's certainly very true. And this is where Gallup comes in because we are uh, across the continent trying to measure certain things that I'm gonna show you in a couple minutes. And I thought that since we were going to focus on governance, accountability, that I would share with you this quote from our late founder, Dr. George Gallup. If democracy is supposed to be based on the will of the people, someone should find out what that will is. And this is exactly what Gallup has been doing for seven years. Most of you are familiar with our work in the United States, but we also have many, many years of experience working uh, in international uh, contexts. And uh, more recently, we've developed this ongoing research project called the World Poll. So the World Poll is uh, what's essentially the largest independent source of survey research around the world. And what we do is we've taken our experience, our depth of expertise doing data collection and analytics in the United States and taking it to over 140 countries around the world. And we started the project in full back in 2006. I started with a project just one year later. Uh, and we go every single year to at least 140 countries and we sample, we do a nationally representative sample of the population aged 15 and older. And we have, of course, uh, a scientific methodology that we follow, and we do probability-based selection of the interviewing locations, which we call primary sampling units, of the households, as well as within each household, how the individual who will be answering our questionnaire, how that person will be selected. So as I mentioned, the coverage is tremendous. It's basically 98% of the world population. And we go not only to urban areas, but we also go to rural locations. And I'm telling you, in uh, many, if not most of the countries I work in, it's quite a challenge. 
Um, we do face-to-face hour-long interviews in the person's home, in the developing world, in the developed world. It's um, a telephone interview that takes about 20 minutes. And our margin of error on a sample size of about 1,000 would be plus or minus three percentage points. So that's, that's quite a big, jo big job that we do every single year. And for the, in terms of the coverage for Sub-Saharan Africa, since the launch of the World Poll, we have basically gone at, done at least one survey. In most cases, it's, it's basically uh, surveys on uh, subsequent years, except in the countries that are mentioned on this, on this slide. So Cape Verde, Equatorial Guinea, no Obiang family, very challenging to work there. Uh, Eritrea, uh, we have not been able to get the government authorization to work in Eritrea. The Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, Sao Tome and Principe, and the Seychelles. Uh, most of the, re the, the reason why we are not, we haven't been in those locations to those locations is uh, it's a cost issue. So except for Eritrea and Equatorial <coughs> Guinea, where uh, it would be a government authorization issue. For 2015, we're going to be in 33 countries. That's, that represents 95% of the adult population aged 15 and older. And uh, as some of you know, the African continent is not just a handful of languages. Um, the research that has been done, linguistic research, has uh, shown that there were at least 3,000 languages. I'm talking about real, like bona fide languages, not just dialects. Languages alone, at least 3,000 in the world, there are, just to give you an, an order of magnitude, 6,000 languages have been um, uh, categorized, classified. So the majority of the world languages are in, in Africa, and we are doing 80 of those languages, and I'm not even talking about all the dialects. So that's quite a feat. It is the 80 languages. It's the most of all the regions that we do this work in, and uh, it's, it's, it's just the linguistic piece of translating our questionnaire is, uh, is a big accomplishment. And this just, uh, just I, I wanted to put this picture for you. This is uh, in Niger. And so this would be like a setup where we were in a, in a rural location here. Uh, and we train our interviewers. So we go in, we work with local agencies that we train. And they, in turn, recruit <coughs> the, local st the local teams, the field staff, who will, because they of course, can speak those local languages. So in Niger, we do, um, aside from French, we do Zarma and Hausa. And um, we train the local team so that they can implement the Gallup methodology in a way that's going to be consistent across the country. And that is why the metrics, the data that we collect in the World Poll can be so powerful, because it's not only having trended data, but it's also the fact that the methodology is the same across all those countries. So when you want to compare responses, you, you know that you are dealing with comparable data sets. So what do we ask people about? So I wanted to give you a few. Th these are the, basically the, the core topics that the World Poll Questionnaire is structured around. So uh, one of our big uh, practices is well-being. Um, and then we also have jobs employment because it is one of the key issues that has to be dealt with not only in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa but all over the world. And we also have questions, items about governance, law and order, uh, country stability, uh, infrastructure, and then we analyze the data, build indices, do a lot of work for clients to get an idea as to how the populations view their own world, view where they live, how they are, 
what what does it, what does it feel like for me right now in Niger in Nigeria in the in the Niger Delta for example because we have to translate those um, questions in so many languages we really need to be very careful how we write questions they need to be you can have a very complex concept but the actual question has to be simple enough that it can be translated and understood across all those languages and that's a big challenge so we want to keep as much as possible questions simple and simple doesn't mean simplistic and so I, here I just wanted to, to share with you two of the, the questions that we have in our core questionnaire. In the city or area where you live, do you have confidence in the local police force or not? Are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the city or area where you live? And we also want, to the extent possible, keep questions, we call them dichotomous. Dichotomous means you have basically two choices. Two choices, yes or no. You're satisfied, you're dissatisfied, you have confidence or you don't have confidence. We, we want to avoid scales, and especially in my region, um, scales are difficult for people to, to comprehend. Like, what's the difference if you're only anchoring the, your, let's say it's a scale from 1 to 10, and you're anchoring only number 1 and number 10, what is really the difference between a five and a six, or a six and a seven? And some people would have difficulty with that, especially people living in rural areas who may not have a very high level of education. So we try to keep things as simple as possible so that it can be used, this questionnaire can be used not only in Africa, um, in uh, urban areas with highly educated people, but also in very remote locations, including in Southeast Asia, for example. So I wanted to focus, I wanted to give you some data on some of the, the indexes that we have built over the years. And I'm going to show you trended data, because I think what's really interesting is to see if we've talked a lot about what the MDGs uh, have done or trying have tried to do, but I think that from the perspective of the people, if there's been any kind of progress. So for our corruption index, we base it on two questions. Is corruption widespread within businesses located in, and then we state their country, or not? Is corruption widespread throughout the government in country name or not. So uh, here I'm going to give you the 10,000 foot view. It's Africans' perceptions of widespread corruption. Unfortunately, they have remained pretty high over the length of time that we have done <coughs> this project in 2007. So if you answered yes on those two questions, you get a one, and then we calculate your score, and then we average the score over 1,000 people to get a country.